because I was still learning what the hell I was doing, trying to figure out how to push a camera around and things. Um, so they stick in my mind more. So yeah, well I saw you in the audience of um, queuing up to see the recent rediscovered uh, Web of Fear. Yes, so, indeed, yes. So did the memories come flooding back when you saw it again? Well they did, yes, you made me speak from the back row. And I, yes. I said I only remember three things about this night, do you remember more seeing it? And, and the things I said then I got wrong as well. <laughs> But uh, yes, because it starts off, it follows on straight from the end, end of the world, doesn't it? There's, yeah. There's not, and so the TARDIS is still spinning out of control, uh, and everyone's apparently sliding out through the doors, being sucked into space. And to do this, we had to make like, a whole set, because that was tilting, so the people appeared to be sliding downhill. Um, we can imagine you can't build a whole set on the slant and then just straighten it up again quickly. Um, so we, the logic was to tilt the cameras, but in those days the cameras were big and heavy, so you couldn't tilt those either. So what we had was a mirror attached to the front of the lens, a 45 degree mirror, which was really built as part of the periscope. But they discovered if you forget the periscope, just put the front lens on, and you can rotate it and you make the scenery rotate. Um, and then, then you have to wait for a break to straighten it up again, just by rotating that mirror. And you look surprised you can do this with Fraser Hines clinging desperately on the scene to try yeah. and look as though it was falling off, managing to reach the mirror panel. And it, it just works a lot better than it deserved to. And there's just one bit I noticed the shot shortly afterwards. Oh yes, before they go to a film, um, but after the time is straightened up, there's just a shot that gets still framed as, as the doctor's sort of walking across it. And you suddenly realise why he's still shooting through the mirror. Because until they get the film, you can't take the mirrors off the cameras. So although the set's now straight, they still I can shoot through a mirror so everything's back to front, except it's then been flopped electronically to prove the right way around again. Uh, and so he's having to think double on the camera, which way do I pan as the actor moves this way? Um, <laughs> and he's just got it slightly wrong, just very slightly. It's your so, complicated stuff. I don't think it was me. <laughs> <That might be. laughs> And um, so, so Clive, visually, so, so, so I don't know how, explain what your, your job had been up in the, in the gallery and, and, yeah, how, so and been, what were the specific challenges of do, doing it on Doctor I've Who? I've been sitting next to the director, shall we say it was Warris, um, on that first, very first series. And there is a bank of buttons, each of those buttons are connected to putting one of the cameras up on transmission. So therefore, my job was to follow a script that Boris had uh, already written, called a camera script, so the cameras would all have their shots, and my job was to cut from one camera to the other in the way that he wanted it cut. Now, there are some directors who actually try and control the cut by flicking their fingers, which is the most annoying thing for anybody on the studio floor to hear this click. Um, others go cut or mix. There was one wonderful old um, director, shall we say he was um, the other way inclined, but um, he used to say to me, cut, and then he'd say, mix. <laughs> everything became kind of very physical for him with me sitting there going, oh, God sake, stop it, Douglas. Mix, darling. That's lovely. So it was basically kind of the output. It was instant editing, like a film editor edits over time. One is editing from one camera to another. And hopefully watching all the camera outputs to see that the right shot was coming up. Because sometimes one would shout out, um, no, no, you should be on a two-shot, you should be on a two-shot camera four. And then he'd either change lens or zoom out. And that was very difficult in those days when we just had turrets and the cameras had four lenses, in that when, in a fast-cutting sequence, the cameras were all changing their lenses from mid-shot to close-up or whatever, or panning to another person, to actually be watching when it was ready and focused. And some of those changes of shot were very rapid, weren't they? And um, eventually we had zooms, and then uh, the zooms could be, what's the word? Um, when you... 
No, no, no. When you pre-select the different angles, oh, yes, on yes, it, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I had buttons on the Zoom that you could set up to preset shots. Now, one of one of the stories I have is of Doctor Who, which unfortunately can't be verified, um, so therefore I can make it up, um, is during the Marco Polo um, series, which still hasn't been found. Well, apparently not. No. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Oh, you don't know? No, I wish I did. If it has, it's taking a very long time to find its way back. Right. If anyone well, knows, you know, so. Well, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I know. It's, I, I, I've heard the rumours like everybody else. Yes. But I don't know. That's Debbie. And I, and I certainly, when I'm in London, I because I, I, I knew that um, Web of Fear was being um, only, but only very shortly before the announcement because. <laughs> It was being stored in the place that I stay in when I'm in London, because um, I stay with Peter Crocker, who remasters yeah. the pictures. Oh, yeah. he, I've been in his office yesterday. He hasn't got Marco Polo in there. So, <laughs> <laughs> any suggestion that it's been it's been remastered? If it has been remastered for DVD, he hasn't done it because he goes to bed before I do. And I, and I, and I look around. <laughs> Uh, and he's, he's definitely not done any work on any other episodes, and he did remaster the Web of Fear and Enemy of the World. Right, well there's, there is a scene where um, the Doctor and his companions are in front of the Kublai Khan's throne in the palace and walking up. And it was sh the, the camera on a motorised um, dolly was following them up the central um, kind of aisle if you like, in this palace to the Kublai Khan. And on either side, there were pillars, all freestanding pillars, and two cameras, camera two and camera three. And on camera two was the wonderful um, cameraman called Dougie Routledge. But Dougie had the unfortunate habit of muttering, um, actually muttering out what his next shot was going to be. <laughs> which sometimes the sound people said, um, Dougie or muttering. Um, and at this time, he was muttering that he couldn't get his pedestal from crab into steer. And crab is when it goes around like that, steer is when it, no, no, we don't. Crab is when it goes across, and steer is when it goes like that. And in so doing and getting annoyed, he knocked one of these pillars, and the pillar was not braced, and came down, crashed down, on a few extras who were staying there. They didn't talk much about extras. <laughs> um, which halted the um, motorised Vinton going up the central aisle. So I cannot remember now whether it couldn't have been on a Zoom, because I don't think we were using Zooms then. But it might have been, I don't know. We had the odd Zoom, but it was a, a great... Well, we didn't didn't know, that was the OB Varitol, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, 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 they probably had the engineers by then. But oh, well, yeah. they had it two huge coffins, and we had to rig it. Yeah. It would be unusual for Doctor yeah. in the sixties. And, and on a train, okay, so. it, it would be unusual. I think. So there was, so there was a pillar having crashed down behind the party walking up to the Kublai Khan, and the only way we could follow them, I think, was that we kept cutting to the side cameras, looking at the Kublai Khan, and then the uh, number one camera at the back would change lens and get closer and closer and closer. And um, nobody ever noticed that because it was never seen. There was a bit of a crash, but there could have been crash people falling over or whatever in the Kublai Khan's palace, I suppose. Pillars were always falling there. <laughs> <laughs> Earthquakes. Yeah, that's right. But I always remember that and remember Dougie, dear Dougie, because um, it was a good cameraman, but uh, he did have that predilection for muttering. Uh, there were a couple people. like that, and you, you were very aware of it if you were tracking them on a crane, if you were the tracker on the swing, and he was on the front, because you had constant talk back from him as well as the director. And so you could hear, you know he was struggling to focus or whatever, you know, <laughs> there was Yes. And the other difficulty, of course, was uh, those directors who, used, who tended to shout into talk back down a microphone because everybody on the studio floor, well most people, obviously the actors don't, but most people have cans on, headphones, listening to what the director is directing. And if you have those 
off your head and quite often people would put their cans onto the boom platform and you'd hear the director shouting. Now I think there's one uh, Doctor Who video where I was asked to identify what these extraneous words were and it was in fact the PA who sits the other side of the director of the vision mixer who was calling the shot numbers and what she does is say shot 103 on one three next which means that shot 103 is on camera one and camera three is the next shot to come and we managed to identify that. Do you remember that? Yeah, it's on the sensor DVD, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Right, right, yeah. You remember it with that, don't you? That's why I'm here. Did I I'm not here for my sex appeal. Did I? <laughs> Did I work on that? You worked on three episodes of the sensor yeah. Did I? Or the, certainly the last couple, yeah. You didn't work on all six. What about this Wages of Fear? No, no, what's it called? No, Web of Fear. Web of Fear, sorry. Well, you, you worked on, I think you worked on a couple of, you were, you were sporadic then, you worked on a couple of episodes of Fury from the Deep. I, I, I'm not sure if you did Web of Fear. You, you, did, you did Power of the Daleks. Um, yeah, you didn't do many trams. When you did, you came in and out. You did a couple of episodes of Wheel in Space with Tristan Javier Cole. Um, oh, Tristan, yes, lovely man. Um, and Web of Fear. The grandson of Horace Javier Cole. Yeah, and he's, yes, he's from Good Stop. He was a great, he was a great prankster. And uh, actually did the HMS Dreadnought prank, That's which right. I repeated on a program called April Fool. However, oh, there we are. That was Tristan the vehicle. Yes, he was a nice chap. And didn't you? Weren't you sort of responsible for the, or helpful in the casting of Sylvester McCoy? Well, Sylvester McCoy was somebody that I found. Um, well, I hadn't found him, but um, he was appearing with Ken Campbell's Roadshow outside the Tower of London on the pavement, having a he was a living bomb, and also he was having a, a walnut cracked on his chest by a sledgehammer. And this was Ken Campbell's roadshow, and he also um, had elastic that smacked into his face, and all sorts of pranks. And I thought he was a great um, kind of practical, practical comedian. And I then used him on a program that possibly you're all too young to remember, called Vision On, which had Tony Hart in it, and Sylvester came on to that, and he was on a lot of my programs, and when it came to Doctor Who, Martin Shebus, who was head of drama, Jonathan Nathan Turner was thinking of not doing the last suit, but who, who was before... Um, Colin Baker was before yeah. Sylvester. And Jonathan had started with Colin. Had he? John, yeah, John, John had been producing yes. for ages at that point. Yeah. So it was at the end of Colin Baker that he thought that he wasn't going to do it anymore. And Martin Shevis had asked me whether I'd consider it. And basically then Jonathan Nathan Turner said he wanted to continue. And I suggested um, Sylvester at the same time as his agent had actually put him up as well. And that's why Sylvester became the seventh uh, doctor, yeah. And Roger, we, we, when we, 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 we haven't really talked about two of the classics that you worked on. It was the only two back-to-back. -back. Tomb of the Cybermen, Evil of the Daleks. Absolutely, yes. So what are your memories of those? Cause, um, uh, Tomb of the Cybermen, yes. I, I thought this is a rip-off of The Mummy. I remember that. <laughs> But they, even a George Pastel, is it George Pastel? I don't know how you pronounce his name. George um, Pastel, yeah. Playing the same sinister, sinister character as he did in the Hammer film of The Mummy, uh, but without affairs this time. Um, yeah, I, I have a thing about scenery, um, and I remember the scenery enormously from Brooklyn to the Cybermen. Um, this huge opening hatch, but they also had these huge back projection screens that were covered in patterns that were flashing all the time. They were, Done with some of the cutouts and polarized to make a pattern, and then another polarizing film behind it so that the patterns would go from black to white, black to white. It was really quite psychedelic, psychedelic looking thing. You, know, you start to think you were flipping out. Um, yeah, and, but, but my, my complaint, as I've said to you before, is that the biggest bit of scenery, which is a huge facade full of these Cybermen with the shot on film, in the Ealing film stage, we only had the bottom two layers in our studio version of it, so we never saw the, the great big, big bit. Because they, they, actually shot, they actually shot that in slow motion, didn't they? Cyber were 
for waking up, which of course in those days you couldn't have done on video. There was no way of slowing video down. Yeah, it's been a big old film sequence. And you had the same problem with Evil as well, didn't you? With e Evil and the Daleks, again, terribly annoying. We never got to see the Emperor Dalek. He was, he was shot on film at the Ealing film stage. He wasn't in our studio. Um, but we did get to do the... Um, there was a final battle, Goody Daleks versus Goody Daleks, and the Emperor gets blown up in the crossfire. Um, and we did the close-ups of Daleks exploding, which which is very cheap special effects. It was just a bit of nylon on the top of the dike, pulled the top off and decapitated it. And then the man inside had a big rubber sack full of slime and gooey and yucky stuff, which they would push up from the knees so it would come and pop on like an erupting volcano and pour down the sides. And I just remember one of the operators coming out afterwards covered in this stuff and smacking as though said, mm, not much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sadly, that's another of those stories that also isn't in Peter Crocker's uh, uh, office. So, uh, we don't, no, so I can make no, so I I I can with, you yeah. like. Don't make up anything about episode two. We can see that, but the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that hasn't got the Emperor Dalek in it either. But two of the side men, this is what we're talking about about multi camera. Again, because it's done virtually as live, what you see when you see it back is, is that they're still using theatrical tricks, if you like tricks that will work in the theatre that weren't some television special effects. There's the bit where the strong man is fighting the Cyberman. And he disappears very briefly out of the side of frame and comes back carrying the Cyberman over his head and holds him down. And of course that brief moment that he's been out of shot, that the Cyberman with a man in it has been swapped for a dummy. Um, and it's not a very good bit of yeah, yeah, I, I, I know, it's seamless. The rock, the rock, the rock, but the switch is good. I think yes. the switch over is good. <laughs> and there were quite a few bits there that people were shooting Cybermats. Yeah. Um, and they're in the studio with a gun, they go bang, and you cut to Cybermats exploding, which is on film. Now, the second try, this, this is incredibly clever because you can't just cut to film any old time, you have to run the film because it's run through a sort of cine machine, it's just a big city projector. With an eight um, second run up. With an eight second run up, yes, you have to have eight seconds of leader strip. So the PA before that gun fires, has to work out a point in rehearsal that's eight seconds before the gun fires, some word of dialogue, some action. And when that happens on, on the transmission, she yells, Run to the city! And then the to the city has this eight seconds in line, you get 10 9 8 flashing up, but it only takes eight seconds. Um, and then you cut to the side of just as it explodes, which is. I mean, timing I mean, is I mean, extraordinary. In fairness, the Cybermax were it wasn't a kabang explosion, but they were spitting smoke and sparks, so there's probably a lean a, a yeah, second, yeah. few seconds mm -hmm. margin for error. But nonetheless, it's bloody clever, isn't it? Well, that's I'm, every time it comes yeah. to film in an episode of Doctor Who, somebody's yeah. had to time it. Yes, in that way. Yeah, but, but in those early episodes. But, but normally, when you have to film, it's a whole scene on film or something. But these are just single shots, picked in. Um, I, actually, I remember when I was a kid watching the Crusades, um, and there's a sword fight in the studio, and then the hero falls down, but he throws his sword. It's bad. Well, I, I can't remember who's good at bad, but the one who loses. It's Derek, Derek Ware is a Saracen warrior. Is he? Yeah. Great. So you, you then cut to it with a sword sticking out of his chest. And, yeah. and of course, that's on film. Yeah. I mean, even as a kid, I had to work out why is that on film. Oh, of course, because in real time, they couldn't have bolted half a sword onto his chest. So they had to pre-record that on film. Yeah. And again, it, it would have required a bang because mm. there's only that second or so that he could be standing around with the sword in his chest before falling over. Ah, the shot before so, the shot where he throws it is also on film. So they've got. Is it? Yeah. Oh right, now I yeah. can spot that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's still it's still only a little bit. Yeah. Mm. And I hate the way he throws the sword because he throws it underarm. Oh, <laughs> pierces rib cage. You do it like that. <laughs> oh. Other than that, it's brilliant. But it, oh, so nearly perfect. Um, let's throw it open before I, I have a geek meltdown. Um, so throw, throw the hands in the air, question for Roger and Clive, who remember have worked all on every era pretty much. Uh, it's basically for, uh, for both guys, I wondered what, what's it like now, looking back at your, your early work and thinking, I was at the beginning of a legend. Well, for those that might, maybe didn't hear as well, I'll say, for the, looking back at your work now, um, what, what does it feel like? being at the beginning, or near the beginning, of a, of, of, of a, of a legend? Well, it, it's quite surprising for me, because as I said, it was only when we were doing it, 
part of a number of programs that we were doing. Um, and the way in which we were doing it, we were learning all the time, we were quite, quite young. Now, are you talking specifically about Doctor Who, looking back? Well, specifically that? Doctor Who, but I realised that it was very much a day-to-day -day job for you then. Yeah. I realised that. And that's why it's, it, it, it's more in retrospect, because it was day to day, it was just a job. But now, it's a little bit more, for us, it's a lot more, but for you guys, I'm, I'm imagining that you're looking back at it slightly differently than you were at the time. Yes, yeah. I, I, well, two memories really strike me. One, one is that A, it's just a job, but also, at the time, I was struggling to get my shots right. You know, to me it was, the hard bit was I was trying to get, like any program I was doing at the time, being a camera woman is quite hard work and I was fairly junior at that time. Um, and so there was this constant struggle, will I get to my next shot on time, will I be in focus, all that sort of thing. That's what I'm worrying about, I'm not thinking, will this be a legend? Or <laughs> even, is this program any good? Because half the time you, you don't get the over. But, but there was, with of all of us, I know from my point of view, you go through a day's rehearsal, um, up until the um, dinner break, usually about 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and you'd start record recording at 7.30 after a line-up, and that's the period when one would go to the little room, to the lavatory, because the adrenaline was really running high. And that running high adrenaline, I don't think I... In those early days, I experienced it much more than I did when I was um, directing and producing. I mean, it was extraordinary that you knew that you couldn't get anything wrong. Nowadays, of course, you can shoot n number of takes until, and if you get some directors who just carry on, their first take is usually the best, but they carry on and on and on until they've got exactly what they want. Then the first take was the only, you know, was the only take, and that adrenaline has been lost, I think, in, in some of the... You can see it in the acting, you can see it in the way in, it's, in which it's shot. And if you're thinking when you're looking at those old programmes, my God, that was actually done in real time. It makes a difference, it really does. You can see the mistakes as well now, because we don't get the same mistakes. I mean, a boom coming in the top of shot um, was always a difficulty for both cameramen and for directors and everybody. Nowadays, they just say, oh, we'll, um, we'll take that out, we'll paint it out or a, a edit or whatever. So you can have all sorts of extraneous things and you can get better sound because of it, because it will be painted out. Well, it's the same with performance. You can piece a performance together. If somebody's a terrible actor and doesn't get it right three times, you can get the three occasions where they do get it right in those bits and piece them all that's together. Right. If yeah. you've got lots of takes, but if, yeah. if you're doing it in one take, you don't. Yeah, right. that's why I but, but I mean, the, the, the adrenaline thing is one of the fact that was why take one was normally the best. You knew it was doomed, didn't you, when you got a, a dress run that was absolutely perfect. You, you know that was it, that's the one we should have recorded, because the next one, they will have gone off the boil. <laughs> you know, they, they all peaked too early. Can I tell the story about Compact? Yeah. I was fishing, there was a, a soap series called Compact, I think it started in 62 or something, yeah. somewhere around there, about a magazine show. And the, one of the lead actresses, uh, called Frances Bennett, who played a character called Gus, this programme went out live on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so it wasn't competing with Coronation Street at that stage. And about ten minutes into the programme, uh, the character Gus was walking down a corridor, and instead of turning left, she turned right into another set. Now, there happened to be two actors in that set who were waiting for that, and there happened to be a camera there, so I cut to that camera, and everybody said, where is it? She'd actually cut 12 minutes out of the whole program, out of a 30-minute program. And then the script editors and producers all went down on the studio floor and tried to reinsert some other scenes so that we would come out near enough on time. The, the program was 29 minutes, 30 seconds long. 
and the PA was saying to presentation, who arranged from going from studio to studio, we were coming out 12 minutes 56 seconds early. Then she was saying, no, we're coming out 8 minutes 13 seconds early. Another scene went in, and there was a thing called a prompt cut, which an AFM used, which cut all studio sound and inserted just atmosphere. So instructions could be, this was going all the time. Suddenly all the sound would go because they were inserting another scene. And it was pandemonium. All our scripts were all over the place. We had no idea. And she never went back into the scene that she should have gone into. There were two guest actors in there who never appeared. <laughs> But those were coming things did used to go wrong. Cameras went down. Um, people did forget their lines badly. Other things happened. Explosions, fires, and everything. And in every studio, we had a caption which said, "Normal service, normal service to be resumed as soon as possible." And sometimes you couldn't resume the normal service, and then presentation we said, well, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> that didn't luckily happen with Dr. Hume. No, meanwhile, here is a Tom and Jerry, usually. Yeah. They have something on stage. All the potter's wheel. wheel. Yes. <laughs> so what was the most disastrous production you worked on, Roger? Because I like that story, that was good. <laughs> I, I don't know that I've ever worked on any that were that chaotic. But, but I remember watching, as a child, the 100th edition of Zed Cars. Do you remember that one? Which, that was, because that was a famous dog, wasn't it? That was a, a famous, well it was a turning point. What, what, the odd thing was, at the end, I still cried, because PC Sweet died. This was the... Uh, and Spoilers, the sorry everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving it away when it's so long ago now. But, uh, despite the fact that the whole thing had been a complete shambles. There were, there were cameras in shots, there was a... I think there was no full measure at the time. There was full measure of running through the frame with headphones. There was, a scene where clearly a door had been left open that shouldn't be shut because there was a camera trying to cross to the other side of the door and you keep seeing this lens sneaking in and they whoop, ducking back again and he was trying to get across every time they cut the other way so you can see the door and then you catch him just starting here and you run back whether he got there or there was a great Z cars where um, the back projection on the Z car because the Z car you know is just the, the shell of the car and you had two back projection screens, that's the, the street from behind and from the side. One uh, was going the other way. <laughs> and then I, I think Bernard Holly tells me of one situation where the car stopped and they have to get out, but they're still <laughs> traveling. <laughs> uh, but they were impossible yes, to time. I they, Oh, 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 Casey Lynch. Yeah, Jimmy Ellis. Yes. Jimmy Ellis, That's yeah. Right. And he actually improvised the line, don't bother to stop, I'll jump for it. <laughs> <laughs> and the number of times you've had to tell his name, Vigor. Yes, yes, and I'm behind that, yeah. yeah. And my, my, as a junior cameraman on that, I had a, a quite difficult shot in which Casey Bannerman, uh, he shouts, there you go, he sees the suspect, and he leaps out of the car and runs towards the camera, and I put a track back with him, which is quite a difficult shot to keep the frame anyway. But I've also got to not see the bits of the Z car aren't there in the background as I go, because it's got no bonnets, it's got no boot, it's got no wheels, no, and there's no glass in the window to get to it, so I'm like, oh, camera guy kind of, yeah, it. it's poked right into their window, and I've got to go perfectly back without being hit by the door. Hold this frame, I, might, I, I haven't got it right all day, but it's now the dress run, it's my last chance to get it wrong right before the tape. And PC Bannerman goes, there he goes, and steps straight out through the windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> so I never got my, I, I assume it worked all right on the night until I don't remember it all working, and I usually remember the ones that get badly wrong. But <laughs> well, this hasn't gone badly wrong, but it has sadly run out of time. These things go far too quickly. So um, but I urge you to chat to these guys when you when you meet them for the signatures and stuff, because we've scratched the surface. But uh, for now, thank you, Clive Doyle. Roger Marks. <laughs>